On this week's episode of the podcast, we're going to be talking about three things that can save you at least 12 hours a month. So stay tuned as we jump into this discussion. Welcome back to another episode of Stuff Your Accountant Isn't Telling You. I am Lola Turner, your host, and I'm welcoming back Mr. Terrell Antonio Turner, my co-host. Hi, Terrell. Hey, what's up? Hey, how are you? I am doing well. I mean, it's still, um, we're still working through the tail end of tax season, so um, busy, but good. All right, cool. Nice. Um, how's your week been? The week has been productive. Uh, I think getting some stuff done, uh, making some sales calls. Uh, working with the team on improving our processes um, because we're always trying to find ways to move faster and deliver quicker um, so we can get the clients information they need so they can make faster decisions. So it has been a week of gaining efficiencies. Awesome. Well, that's good. I think that aligns very well with what we're going to talk about this week. (laughs) Um, so very, very good and very timely because I, you know, as a business owner, I understand a lot of business owners. I mean, you know, you're listening to this, your business owner, even you Terrell is just, your time is very valuable and how you spend your time and how your team spends this time is also very valuable. So you always want to maximize your time. So I'm excited to jump into today's like points we want to highlight, and these are going to be actionable tips or I guess actionable tips that you can go do and make changes on relatively quickly to see the time savings, you know, in when it comes to your business. Anything else you want to highlight before we jump in? Anything else you want to discuss? Yeah. I mean, I think about when it comes down to efficiencies, one of the things that comes to mind is that old saying of time is money. And even, you know, no matter what type of business that you have, I mean, your time that you spent, you're spending on things, there, there is a cost to it. I mean, there is some type of value to it. So finding efficiency is probably one of the best ways for you to increase profitability or to redeploy that time to something else. So I think this is going to be a really good topic. I agree. I also on the redeployment point you mentioned, I think that is extremely important because sometimes people are like, well, I'm going to save all this time and what do I do with it? You would be surprised at, I mean, a great example of what you can do with the extra time is go generate more sales and more revenue (laughs) or find other areas in your business where, hey, you know what? I've been I've been meaning to attack this and I've been meaning to make improvements here, but I just didn't have the time. So this is going to help you free up the time that you need to go do other things in your business. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in. So the first one I want to talk about is setting up automatic payments and billing. So before we jump into the meat of this, Terrell, what are some of the things that kind of come to your mind when I say like, hey, you need to make sure your payments, you need to make sure, you know, your your billing is as automated as possible. Yeah, I mean, the the nightmares that business owners go through is what comes to mind of, Mm. you know, there have been so many businesses that I have, you know, talked to. One is either they weren't billing, where I was talking to one business owner, where I was looking at, hey, when's the last time you done invoicing? It was like, it's been about four months since I sent out invoices. We've kind of been like operating off of the, you know, we had enough cash in the bank on reserves. And I'm like, oh, wow, you need to um, like you need to send these bills out to clients like they need to pay you like we need to get these invoices sent out. Uh, yeah, four and, months and is a long time. It is. I mean, because I mean, it, it, even if I, I and I drew the analogy this way, I said, hey, let's say if you were working a job, would you show mm-hmm. up and do your job for four months without getting paid? Um, chances are, no, you wouldn't. So I'm just like, right. why are you doing that to yourself? Because it is your business. Um, yeah. And you know, so when working with clients on stuff like that is like, all right, you got a billing process in place. The other piece was, okay, how do you collect the payments? And, you know, people having questions about, well, I, I don't know which invoice is still open or um, how do I make the payment or can I get somebody on the phone so I can take the payment online? And it's just like all of these different types of things. Like, how do you, like, if you figured out a way to automate that, this would take a lot of headache off your hands. Plus, it will save you a lot of time from doing this back and forth. And you will get paid. 
Yeah, as someone who has done the billing for our business, I agree a thousand percent with that because when we started, I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a slow process, and even as we grew and as we advanced, like, I'm not gonna lie, like billing at the beginning of the month was something that I dreaded because I was just like, man, like, you got to do the billing process, you got to make sure you don't miss stuff, and then also like, especially for recurring clients, it's just you know a lot of clients find it easier for you just to have a if it's the same amount every month, just bill me, same same process, I'll pay it every month. Let's set it as a recurring payment. And when we didn't have that option for our clients, it was just a very tedious and oftentimes like annoying process that I dreaded. So I absolutely can agree and say that automating our billing has saved me a lot of time. And also yeah. automating, the other part I also wanna add is not just automating the billing, but also automating the payment. So like, for example, one of the yeah. tools that we're recently using is, I'm not, you know, one of the tools that we use in our business for payments and setup and billing, the customer and client has the option to basically put their credit card on file and every month it charges them. There's nothing that we have to do on our end. And that has saved countless and time, countless of times, not just for us, but also for our clients where they're not having to be like, oh, did I miss an invoice this month? They can automatically know that each month at the specific set time, it's going to be charging them for that, you know, for that service and that specific amount. I noticed you're a little hesitant to, to say the name, so I'm just going to say it. So all right, we use Ignition. Um, because right, I'm like, so you ain't sponsoring for, our podcast, so that's, <laughs> that, that, that's true. But but I mean, I even think about it from the standpoint of just helping the audience. So I will yeah, say true. is, from my perspective, you know, we use, it used to be called Practice Ignition. Now they've, they've, they've rebranded, changed the name to just Ignition. And I think Ignition is a great tool especially for service-based businesses, because you can draft up the proposals of the contracts, you can send the proposal out, and during the proposal process, people can put their banking information in or their credit card information. So when they sign the contract, and you can set a schedule on how frequently the invoices should come out, let's say if they're doing a monthly, the invoices are going to come out monthly, and when the invoices come out, it will charge the, the account number or the credit card on file. So that way you don't have to worry about going out and trying to, you know, chase people down to get payment or to collect funds and to collect money and stuff like that, because it is freed up, a, you know, it's freed up a good bit of time to where we're not having conversations. And, and I think also on the finance side is, one of the things that people don't consider that they are spending time doing is when it comes down to decisions you're trying to make in your business about like, hey, do we spend money on this or can we move forward with this marketing strategy? Well, I got to wait until we collect payment from these customers. Well, if that stuff is automated, that money is going to hit your bank account pretty much on schedule to where it's no longer causing you to delay and have to play this cash timing game that you used to pay used to play because you were waiting on collecting from people who owed you money that's a good point i think another one just back to the ignition point is that i think when it was originally created specifically for accountants i don't know if part of the rebranding is now focused solely on service or i guess more expanded to other service type businesses but that is something to keep in mind um any other points you want to make before we move on to the next point yeah i mean I, I do think for a lot of people is when it comes down to like that, that billing process automating it is you know your business is going to grow through different phases at one point in time like i said we started off basically using quickbooks where we had to create each invoice and then we moved into you know using dubsado and we outgrew that tool um to now we're using practice ignition i do think you do have to figure out what makes sense for your business as you evolve because the payment process that you're using when you start may not be the same one you use as your business grows or there's a little bit more complexity or just, you know, you're finding, you know, a tool that's more efficient. I mean, that was for us. Like we went from Dubsado to Ignition because Ignition was a better fit for us. Um, and it solved pain points that, you know, Dubsado wasn't able to solve. And so I do think as a business, when you're trying to make that process more efficient, um, you know, is really realizing it. your needs may change over time, which means you may need to change the solution. Now, practically speaking, 
um, from your perspective, Lola, how much time did you, you know, us switching to ignition and automating the collections process, how much time did that save on your end? Um, I'd probably say three to four hours a month. And, and that's more so on the part of following up on the invoices, because a lot of times if it was more so on a lot of times, like people just don't see it or like, hey, you know, it's it's drowned in the middle of all their emails. So really, it was more so the following up and then also not having to do kind of the, uh, you know, the billing every single month. So I still check it because we're a couple of months into ignition. So I'll go through and I'll just validate it, just to make sure everything goes out when it should. Um, but it definitely is a lot less time um, now than it was before. So about three to four hours a month. Awesome. Awesome. So what's the next tip we want to talk about? Actually, one thing, sorry, before we move on to the point, another point of the automated process that we didn't talk about was automated payments. So automated billing is one piece, but also automated payments is another factor where if you have recurring you know, subscription based services or certain things like that, where it's the same amount of same amount every month, automating those pieces as well. So it makes it a lot easier and you're not having to go through and like pay bills every month um, where you can avoid that. So the next one um, is a fun one that we also all love to talk about on the show, which is outsourcing your bookkeeping. So outsourcing your bookkeeping will save you a bunch of time every month. But Terrell, you are the subject matter expert here. So I want us to talk about, you know, outsourcing bookkeeping. So when you think about that, what are the first things that come to your mind with outsourcing your bookkeeping and just some of the challenges like business owners that don't do it see? Yeah, I mean, I think the first one is most business owners who say that they're doing their own bookkeeping, they're not really doing it. Um, they're waiting until whether it's their taxes need to be done or the thing that I consistently hear bookkeeper, I mean, business owners say is, I know I need to update my bookkeeping or I know I need to update my accounting records. I just don't have time for it or I haven't gotten to it. And I'm like, if that's something that you're continually saying, like, you know, one of a couple of things. Either you need to, you know, get the right tools in which I meet with a lot of business owners where we'll do a consulting session where we'll, we'll help them understand either how to use the tools they have or we'll give them some easy to use tools so that they can start actually getting some visibility to what's going on. The second one is you got better things to do with your time. Like right. you're busy trying to either meet with clients or you're trying to grow the sales or you're trying to, you know, meet with your staff to make sure you can deliver the service or the product. It's like at some point you do have to just be honest with yourself and say, you know what? I don't have time to do this myself. Yeah. I need to hire yeah. somebody else to do it because there are so many business owners that I see that are wasting time trying to convince themselves that they have the time to do the bookkeeping themselves because they want to save a few hundred dollars. And I'm just like, you know, you might be saving a few hundred dollars, but you're wasting probably hours and hours of time. Like if you look at the time you're wasting compared to the money you're saving, you're probably losing more money than you're actually saving. If you looked at the time you were, you were wasting. Yeah, that's a really good piece. I think one of the, a really good point rather, one of the things that you've said before that I think really resonated with me and I want to share with the audience is if you think about the value of your time, you think about it in the sense of like, we work with a lot of lawyers. So if you think about it, let's say in the sense of billable hours, right? The time that you're spending doing your own bookkeeping, how many billable hours could you be doing and actually generating revenue with those hours? But instead you're spending it on your bookkeeping process. And so if you just do a comparable rate and say, hey, I charge X dollars a, an hour for this, these are the billable rates that my time could be used on. Instead, I'm using it to do bookkeeping to save myself, I don't know, five, $600 a month. How much time, how much is it really costing me, you know, or what's my opportunity cost is another factor, right? What's, what's my opportunity cost in making this decision? And I think a lot of times as business owners, we don't think about, okay, what am I giving up to be able to do this? Cause people are like, yeah, it's my time. It doesn't take me that long. It only takes me three, four hours, but it's like, what could you be doing with the three, four hours that you're doing your bookkeeping? And to your point, Terrell, like really at the end of the day is like, are you even those three, four hours? Are you even doing it correctly to where at the end of the year or at the end of the month or at the end of the quarter, you can actually have a clear set of financial statements that actually tell you what the heck is going on with your business? 
Yeah, most people I see that are doing the bookkeeping themselves, especially those, let's say, if you have employees and staff, they are doing mm-hmm. it wrong. And what they don't realize is the way that they're doing the bookkeeping, they're making errors in it. And when they get ready to file their business tax return, either mm-hmm. the CPA or the tax preparer that they're working with is going to have to do extra work to fix what they messed up or the tax preparer is going to file it. And what they don't know is that, especially around employer payroll taxes and employee wages and compensation, if that doesn't match what is on your 941, so your quarterly tax returns that the IRS has already seen, if there's a mismatch there, then it starts to flag, your company could be flagged and more at risk of being selected for an audit because discrepancies are popping up. And a lot of that comes is because most people who are doing their own bookkeeping, they don't understand how, you know, how to do proper accounting for payroll. And they don't know that they could be causing a potential audit issue or being flagged for an audit because they're making this mistake. And so one of the things that I always tell people is, you know, let's say, you know, for a, a let's say a, a, a business that's doing, let's say, about half a million dollars in annual revenue. I mean, mm-hmm. you're doing half a million in annual revenue. So that comes out to what is that what roughly what 60,000 a month or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, let's say if that's roughly $60,000 a month in, in monthly revenue. I mean, to do the bookkeeping, if everything is running smoothly to do the bookkeeping for that client, you're looking at probably, you know, two to three hours a a week minimum to do the bookkeeping for that. And that's if you are really good. Now, if you're a business owner and you're kind of doing it on the side, you're probably not going to be as efficient as two to three hours a week to do it properly. So, I mean, if you think about that, that's eight to 12 hours worth of work. Now, one of the things that I always tell people is if you had 12 to eight hours to, you know, follow up with clients, to talk to your referral sources, or even to talk to potential new clients, how many new clients do you think or how much new business could you get if you had an extra eight to 12 hours a month to spend on your sales process? Every person that I talk to says, oh, yeah, we can definitely increase our revenue by, you know, hundreds or even a couple thousand a month. Then I'm just like, well, if you could spend that time growing your revenue, making more money, you can afford to outsource the bookkeeping. You just got to spend your time on the things that are a better use. And whenever I walk people through that analogy or that example, they start to see like, oh, you know, it does make sense to outsource this because if I'm saving eight to 12 hours, I can actually make more money by outsourcing this so I can do smarter things with my time. Yeah, that's a really, really, really good point. And I apologize. When you said five, half a million, I was thinking you said 720. So half a million <laughs> a year. My bad. Half a million a year is actually like 40 something, 42 grand maybe a month. 42. Um, okay. Yeah, 42 grand a month. But um, no, I think that's a really good point. And I think that when you, one of the things that I like that we do with people that we work with, even through the consulting sessions is we make it plain and kind of just break the numbers down. Like, okay, this is what it looks like. If I was to put this down, this is how much time you're saving. This is how much time you're spending. Like, what could you do with that time? Because I think when you actually put it out there and write it down, it becomes so much more real to the business owner than just saying what we're saying now. So I thought that walkthrough was really good, Terrell. Yeah, I mean, and I think it it really does come down to that simple. And like I said, your numbers are going to change, you know, you know, no matter what you're doing, your numbers are going to change. They're going to vary. Um, But the math just tends to add up. If you really look at what does it take to do this properly? And I would say anyone who's running a business, if you're doing more than you said, the math on that came out of like 42 grand a month. So if you're doing, I would say, 40 grand plus a month, at that point, it's really time for you to look at hiring a bookkeeper because you doing it yourself does not seem like the best use of your time. And at that point, you probably you have there's a lot of room for you to make errors if you don't know what you're doing. And those errors could turn out to be a, a bigger problem for you later. 
Yeah, I, I guess I'll just give an example because I think again, practical practical application. So, what are some of mis some of the bookkeeping mistakes you've seen? I'll go first that I think have caused problems or issues. I'd say for some of the real estate clients, like one mistake that I often see a lot of times is for clients that have real estate is they will categorize their entire mortgage payment as an expense, business expense. Yeah. Like that's one mistake that is oftentimes made instead of like categorizing it appropriately because in this mortgage payment that you're making, you're making a payment on interest, you're making a payment on the principal, and then you're also making insurance payments. So all of those three transactions are supposed to be treated differently. Like for example, if you're paying towards your principal, like that's not really an expense, you're paying a loan down. So those kind of things I think are good examples, Terrell. What are some other examples of like mistakes that you've seen made by people well, that are doing well, their own bookkeeping? One of the things I want to say on that is because I know people are maybe thinking like, OK, so if I'm making that it, that, you know, making that mistake, so what? I'm like, well, again, if you go back to taxes, well, the bank that you have the mortgage with, they're mm -hmm. already filing a 1099 with the IRS or I think it might be a 1098. I forget exactly which one. I think it's 1098. They're, mm -hmm. So they're already telling the IRS, hey. So and so has paid X amount of interest on their mortgage. So when your tax return gets done and the interest expense you have is different from what is on those forms that the IRS already has, again, you're setting yourself up to be flagged for an issue. So, I mean, right. it, it's, it's not just, hey, well, it's just a minor accounting issue. It's like, no, the, the IRS has ways of, you know, of, of, of yeah, I guess you say correlating that to another number. And if you have yeah. errors, it's like you're exposing yourself to unnecessary risk because, you know, there was a mistake that you just didn't know how to catch. I think the other one is when it comes down to like payroll taxes, because um, a lot of people, when they have employees, oftentimes or your payroll company, when you make payroll, it's going to be, you're going to have like two bank transactions. There's going to be one for the net pay that hits the employee's check. And then there'll be another transaction that are for the taxes. Now, this is the portion of taxes you withheld from the employees, plus mm -hmm. the portion of taxes that the company has to pay. One of the things that I see a lot of businesses do is they put the whole thing to payroll taxes. Well, mm -hmm. when you get ready to file your taxes, if that's the number you put on your tax return as the payroll taxes that you paid, again, the IRS is going to look at your 941s and see, well, the payroll taxes you reported on these forms is different from what you're saying in your tax return. Again, you expose yourself to an unnecessary error because you didn't understand how to do proper payroll accounting. And I'm like, you know, save yourself some time and headache and just just hire a bookkeeper. Yeah. And the other thing also that I think about is oftentimes, you know, people are like, whatever, like I have a, someone that does my taxes, they'll catch this, they'll fix it at the end of the year. <laughs> it's going to cost you money to fix it because now they're having to go back and basically root, like do a root cause analysis, figure out where the problem started, fix it for you. And all those are hours, which is why one of the reasons why your tax bill may be as high as it is <laughs> because they're going back and basically having to fix and replicate it. And a lot of times you, it doesn't guarantee the issue is actually going to be caught because to be fair, a tax accountant is doing how many, like hundreds of tax returns at a, yeah, you know, I mean, at a given time. So there's really no guarantee that even if there is a mistake that you make on your end, that your tax accountant or tax preparer is going to be able to catch it in a very short period of time because you have a year's worth of financial records that they're basically having to prepare on the spot for you and then also make sure it's done correctly. And I mean, it just leaves room for errors. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say it's like, even if you think about yourself, I mean, let's say, you know, if you were on a tight deadline and you had, you know, a hundred things that you had to get cleared off your list within the next mm -hmm. two weeks, how much time to detail are you giving each of those hundred things? <laughs> Listen, you focus on the top first, the ones that are going to cause the most, that are the most impactful. So I'm guessing probably revenue, like a couple of things. And then everything else is like, if I get to it, I get to it. Right. And that's not the right thing. And that's not the right approach. But to be honest, you don't want to find yourself in that position. But you will find yourself in that position is if you don't have a good bookkeeping process, 
And a lot of times it's just hire a bookkeeper to do all this for you because then it's on them to make sure they get you correct financials and it becomes a very seamless process to hand that over to your tax accountant at the end of every year and takes the headache away from you. And I think that's why a yeah. lot of people dread tax season, business owners dead, dread tax season because it's almost like, man, like I have to go figure out and remember what happened at the beginning of the year because they weren't really as engaged in that through the year. Yeah. One of the other things that I would say, and this has happened a couple with a couple of clients where we've taken some clients on and they were using different types of like payment processors. And in the process of us, you know, digging into the details, doing our reconciliations, you know, we identified some really big issues to where there were some payment processors that had gotten set up where they weren't set up properly. So they weren't actually receiving the cash in their bank account associated to all these sales. And, and I remember talking to the client, we laid it out and said, hey, there's about $120,000 that are missing. We need to go back to this payment processor. We need to talk to them. We talked to them, came back, and they said, yes, your money has been sitting in this escrow account because we didn't know wow. where to send it. <laughs> and so, wow. you know, the client was like, well, thank you, you know, Terrell, you and your team, because you guys found this. But it was like, had you guys not been looking into this, we would have never found this. And he was like, exactly. He was like, you know, I, he was stressed out because he was like, you know, the business should have more cash in the bank account. Like, where is it mm. going? And he was mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm grateful that you guys are looking at this because he said there is no way possible I have the time or even the know-how to figure out what you figured out. And like I said, they got their $120,000 check. So their bank account went back to where it should have been. And we're monitoring things. And there are so many businesses that are using different type of payment processors, payment applications that are, weren't set up right. But the thing is, if you don't have a bookkeeper who understands how to do the reconciliations, like you could be missing out on money that belongs to you. And it's just sitting in some third party, you know, trust account or, you know, third party account waiting to be claimed by you. But if you don't have anybody that can dig into the details, you might never get it. Yeah, that's really good. $120,000 can be the difference between cash flow positive and, <laughs> and closing your business down for a lot of business owners. So that's a pretty yeah. big deal. It's $120,000 yeah, I mean, uh, miss. <laughs> yeah, $120,000. I mean, it, it's a very big deal. I mean, even for, you know, I mean, good thing for that company. I mean, that company is doing, you know, really good revenue anywhere from like 90 plus thousand a month in revenue. But still, I mean, that's like a whole month's worth of revenue that's missing yeah. to where it's just like, right. hey, that will take care of a lot of things and investments you want to do in your business. I mean, because... One of the things you don't want to do is be a business owner and be stressed about what's going on with the money. Like, do you have enough money to survive or to stay in business? And, right. you know, it's being able to have and rely on a good bookkeeper that is, you know, really reconciling, going through your numbers, being able to provide you with the financials so you can see the picture of what's going on. It, it not only saves you time, but it's a, it's a huge stress reliever too. Yeah, no, that's really good. I think that is a very, very important point in all of this is as much as we talk about saving you time, I think we also uh, it also alleviates your stress because if this is not an area of expertise for you, it's going to take you longer to do it and it's going to take you longer to figure out if there is a problem. Whereas that time should be used to focus on the things that you are good at and the areas where you can actually help make sustainable changes in your business. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, the last one that I wanted to talk about that I think this one is a big game changer. And, and this one is you're probably not going to get this from, you know, from a basic accountant, a basic bookkeeper. I mean, this is the stuff your accountant isn't telling you is one of the things that will save you time is to simplify your financial reporting. Um, mm -hmm. And so when you hear that, Lola, what's the first thoughts that come to mind for you? Life flow. <laughs> <laughs> no, but on a more serious note, like for me, I think it's, if I'm thinking about, I think, I think, I, I think about it on two ends. Like once one end, I think about it as a business owner, right? 
is if I if I'm hiring a bookkeeper and I think about it even in the jobs and the roles that I've worked in is people don't pay you as an accountant and a finance person. They don't pay you to basically have them have to do the work to figure out what's going on in the business. As a finance person, people pay you to give them answers. So if you think about it, what is the quickest way for you to give a business owner an answer about how their business is doing? It's about simplified accounting and simplified a simplified view. Is my business making money? What are the red flags I need to pay attention to this month? Hey, are there any areas where, hey, I'm losing money, I need to go focus on, you know, maybe cutting costs there? Like, the quickest way in my view to be able to provide that information as an accountant to your customer is through tools like LifeFlow because you create processes that allow you to be able for them to be able to easily identify this. And I'm I'm not just saying it because, you know, it is what it is, but I I think that I've seen a very major and a very big change in even client delivery. I'll speak specifically for the clients that I support, like client delivery in them being able to say like, okay, like in the past before I, when I used to get financials from the last bookkeeper I was working with, it was really hard for me to even follow and understand like what was going on with my numbers. Whereas it's like, okay, now that I have easy accessibility to the data that I'm putting together using LifeFlow, I can, that process is automated. I don't have to worry about how I'm getting that data. And then I can focus more on making it digestible for my customer. Right. And so for me, from my perspective, I would say simplified, simplified accounting, simplified reporting. How do you get the answers that your customers need quicker in as an accountant? How about you? I feel like I yeah, I mean, a lot. I, think the, the, uh, I think the I think that getting to the point, I mean, it is how do you make it easier for your clients to understand what's going on? Because the, mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is most business owners do not understand how to read financial statements. And that's not a bad thing that they don't understand how to read financial statements because they don't need to understand all of it. I mean, especially right. if you have an accountant, like it's the accountant's job to tell you what you need to know in it and help you understand right. the parts that are relevant to you. Like, for example, like some of my, I was on a call with a client yesterday and we were talking through, she was saying, you know, what are the six statements that I really need to know? And we went through the P&L in detail. And I was like, you know, to be honest with you, we went through our balance sheet. But I'm like, really, the things that are going to change on your balance sheet is the cash, your credit card balance, and the balance on this loan that you have outstanding. All the mm -hmm. other stuff like, you know, your retained earnings, shareholders, equity, like you don't really need to know that you're not making day-to-day -day decisions that are driving that. Like we can talk about that if you have a specific question, but what I really wanted to focus your attention on, because I only have a limited amount of time because, you know, she was in between, you know, going through, you know, leading, she was the lead attorney on seven different trials. You don't have the time to dig through all the statements. I need to, I need to break this down for you. What are the key things that you need to know? And so, one of the things that, that that we did is we we looked at a lot of different you know tools and and we would build a lot of stuff in Excel and I was like okay how do we make this even easier and and I think you know you mentioned it earlier with Live Flow I mean I think for any accounting firm out there I, that has clients that are on QuickBooks I highly recommend taking a look at Live Flow because what it did is it allowed us to create custom kind of dashboards or custom kind of files. So like for our, for example, our restaurant clients, they need to know revenue, food costs, and labor. Those are their right. very, their three biggest things that they need to keep an eye on. And so we created custom tools that give them those three numbers every single week against a forecast. And they share that with their managers and their managers are able to look at those three numbers and manage the business even better. I mean, when you get mm -hmm. into looking with the law firms, I mean, they need to understand revenue. They need to understand labor costs. They need to understand marketing spend. And they need to understand overall cash flow. Looking at those metrics, and I think with a tool like LiveFlow, we were able to create just those key metrics. Now, we still provide the full financial statements, but... I think when you think about, you know, going back to the timing, like you don't need to spend all your time trying to understand your entire P&L. 
what are the three or four key things you need to know from this PL? If you get that, if that gives you enough to run your business, I always say is like, mm-hmm. hey, we can talk about the other stuff later, but you need to get to the point and get the main points faster and find your, and your accountant. That's their job to figure out a way to do that for you. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think you made some really good points. The one point I want to amplify a little bit is just the specific reporting according to your customer industry. So like, for example, if you're in, like you said, the restaurant space, there are things that you're going to focus on that, you know, someone that owns a law firm may may not be focused on. And so I think my my recommendation to accountants is always looking for the easiest way to provide value to your clients. Because at the end of the day, you're serving these customers. And I remember specifically in my case, even just a lot of times with sales guys that I would work with in some of my last couple, in my last couple of roles, a lot of times the question was, hey, Lola, like, what do I need to go sell? Right. And for them, it was a question of there was heavy focus on revenue. And so I needed to be able to see what is their what is their agreed upon target we've established and where are they month to date versus that target? What's the gap and where do they need to do to hit it? So I think the financial statements as a whole are great. But I think a lot of times, like you said, business owners don't have the bandwidth to be able to sit down and go through the entire financial statements and do a deep dive. So how do you as an accountant tailor that information to make it easier for them without basically having it be an exhaustive process for you, um, an exhausting process for you? And then the way to do that is to leverage the tools that you have. Absolutely. I mean, and and I think at the end of the day, I mean, all of these tips, I I would say, are, are very helpful to save you time. I mean, you talked about the billing, you know, automating mm-hmm. the billing and automating the payment receipt process. I mean, that saved you about, you know, three hours a month. Um, yep. Bookkeeping, I think minimum saves you, you know, eight to 12 hours. So let's just round it up to 10 and say, you know, 10 hours. I mean, that's 13 hours right there. And I think getting the right report so you know what to pay attention to, I mean, that's going to save you probably another you know, that's two to three hours. So let's just say two hours. So, I mean, that's 15 hours a month. And what I always tell people is if you had an extra 15 hours a month, how many more customers could you Mm. actually go win if I gave you 15 extra hours a month? And what most people will realize is, man, if I spent 15 extra hours on marketing or 15 extra hours on sales, or maybe you know, I got all the sales that I need. Maybe I just want 15 hours of a break. Maybe I just want 15 hours to relax a little bit more, to take time off. I mean, 15 hours is like, you know, for depending on how long your work day is, that could be, you know, almost two days, two work days that you get back in your life by just being smart about using some of these tips. So, I mean, I think these tips are huge to help business owners. I fully agree. No, so definitely all about saving you guys time and share this episode with your accountant. If you have an accountant, let them know, hey, we have the tools and resources we've shared on this episode to help them basically be able to provide better value to you in a timely manner. So that does it for this week. And now, Terrell, we're going to go into the tax tea of the week. All right. So what is our tax tea for the week? All right. So our tax tea of the week is going to actually be about an accountant who has been convicted, who was recently convicted um, for working as an accountant for basically doing a legal activity. So it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> the accountant was has been charged with college, what, what they call college admission schemes. All right. So for a period of from 2008 to 2017, which is actually a pretty long time, nine years, this accountant was working for an organization called Counseling it was Counseling Services is what they did. And basically, long story short, what this organization was doing was they would um, basically have like parents would pay this owner of the business money to basically bribe coaches to get into, you know, get into specific schools or pay off admission officers and all of those things. Cause you remember a couple of years when there was that whole admission scandal. 
you remember that? Like celebrities mm-hmm. had paid off, yep. like t- paid off people. So basically a similar process. Um, but this was the accountant for that business. And so he like <laughs> was charged with, he was charged with like, at least they ha- at least they were smart and got an accountant. Right. But he was charged. He was charged with like invoicing parents for these illegal payments. So basically they would pay the company would pay the bribery charges to the college admission officers or the coaches. And then he would turn around and invoice those cost, you know, invoice the, um, the parents. invoice, the parents. And then he actually claimed that it was like legitimate. Um, I think, I don't remember what he called the charges, but he actually claimed it on, you know, the financial statements of the company, which, you know, per the per the rule of the IRS, you have to, you know, you have to mention all of business related charges, even though they may be illegal. But um, so basically included those in the financial statements. But really, the biggest thing was that the money was, of course, illegally um, was for an illegal activity. Um, and so his charge wasn't actually that big. He's been sentenced, suspended for three years. So I don't know if he's going to have the option to be able to practice again. And then he has to pay a twenty thousand dollar fine. Um, for this, but not the, you know, not as intense, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I think that becomes important because I mean, when you have a, you know, a professional license, I mean, and I'm assuming if he was suspended for three years, that must've meant he had some type of professional license or whatever. I mean, there are ethics involved with this of like, mm-hmm. Hey, if you know that what you are doing, the accounting for is illegal activity, but you are, you know, changing the verbiage or you're changing the language to disguise illegal activity like right. you're definitely going to get yourself you, i mean you're going to be in trouble because you know as a licensed professional you have to hold yourself to a higher standard um mm-hmm. and you can't just be like well i didn't know what the money was for i was just invoicing i was just following instructions just like nah it's not gonna fly like yeah you know, as as an accountant, and that's why I always tell people, business owners is if you're working with an accountant to where your accountant just does what you say and asks no questions, no type of mm. verification or documentation for it, you might not be working with somebody who's on the up and up. Um, and so I what would definitely up say up? <laughs> like somebody like, who is like really legit about it, like someone, oh, for example, okay, okay. like if you're. Because I've seen business owners who, you know, business owners who like, hey, I heard this on TikTok or I heard this on Instagram and they'll come back to their accountant or their bookkeeper and say, hey, I heard we can do such and such. And the bookkeeper just does it. And it's just like, no, that's not right. Like (laughs) Your bookkeeper should have told you or your accountant should have told you. Yeah, I know you heard that, but either your business doesn't qualify for that or. Mm-hmm. That TikTok video you saw wasn't right. That's wrong. Um, and right. so I think you want to work with someone who is willing to support you and the things that you're trying to do, but also will be able to, you know, hold you accountable to say, hey, I'm not going to do this because number one is it exposes me to potential exactly. um, disciplinary action. And exactly. it also exposes you to disciplinary action. Like, my job is not just to do your books and have a blind eye to it. I mean, part of my job is to help keep you out of trouble as well. Exactly. No, that's a really good point. And actually, now I forgot one last point. This, he can't say that he didn't know what the charges were for because he was basically facilitating both sides of the transaction. So he was char- <laughs> he was he was paying the money to the college uh, college coaches, and it wasn't just for sports; it was also for like SAT, ACT, like. So he, was stuff. The bri- he was so he paying was the bribe. He was paying the bribe, and then he was making invoices. <laughs> yes, and then he basically falsified documents that allowed parents to claim these as donations on their taxes. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah I'm surprised. So, I'm surprised that he just didn't. I mean, I'm surprised that they didn't do more than just suspend. Like, did they give him jail so, time for this? Yes, but he's been released. Like he's super he's supervised for he's been supervised for three years. So I don't know. I guess that's like probation or something. Like so house arrest like or something. Release. I guess so. Yeah. It didn't mention specifics. It just said that he said it's a he said um three years of supervised release and was ordered to pay twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, because so. once you get into, I mean, once you get into actual lying about what yeah. you're doing, like mm-hmm. that becomes a whole nother, a whole nother crime. 
is, I mean, it, it's one thing to say, hey, I did this, but then to say, hey, I did this and I and lied I on tax forms about it and yep. I helped other people lie and say these were donations. And it's just like, because mm-hmm. I'm like, well, what organization did they donate the money to? Like, this, now this you, you key just, organization, this key worldwide foundation, whatever it's called. So they disguise themselves as maybe some sort of counseling service, some sort of counseling service for students. And so that's how wow. they masked it. And so the parents, I guess, were, I guess the parents were, were saying, claiming that they were writing these payments off as donations because they were maybe putting into whatever services these counseling, this counseling company was offering, but it was all bogus. So. I mean, yeah. I, I would say that is so wrong on every level. I like, I, and, and this will be the last <laughs> thing I say on this because I know we got to wrap this up. But I, I mean, I do think this one is a warning for anyone who's giving to a charitable organization. If you are directly receiving some type of benefit from that organization, then the gift that you're giving, it might not be 100% tax deductible. Like you can only mm. deduct, you know, the the value of whatever you're giving that may not be directly attached to some benefit that you're getting back. Like, say, for example, like if I'm paying for my child to go through some counseling program, like I can't deduct that as a 100 percent tax deduction because my child is receiving a direct benefit attached to the money that I'm giving. So, I mean, if you ever find a situation where where that's happening, like I will say is it is a red flag. You definitely need to talk to someone who knows what they're doing so you don't end up getting yourself into trouble. And because I'm sure all of these families that took these as deductions for these nine years, now all of their tax returns have to be amended and they got to go back and they got to pay taxes on this. And plus, you know, their child probably got kicked out of school. Uh, once they found out so it's like yeah. you gotta pay taxes you can't get your money back your child got kicked out of school and you might actually get in trouble for this to where it's just like man this is a mess yeah and i was gonna say like i guess because they were convicted in 2022 what happens if you've already graduated at that point like do they repeal your do they repeal your admission or your your degree like how do you even handle that I, I don't know. I mean, I, what I will say is, is that, you know, even if they don't repeal your degree, I mean, I mean, I will say for, for the kid, if the kid did not know this was going on and let's say their yeah. parents were doing this without their knowledge or whatever, I would say that's a different situation. But I will say even in that case, I mean, this story will follow you around. I mean, because if you, even if you think about like the big, you know, some of the celebrities that were involved with, you know, the college scandal, I mean. Even the kids think about like their children, like people know who their parents are to where Mm -hmm. it's just like that reputation and the weight of that now follows your kid wherever they go. Like if people know that that's your parent, like your parent went to jail for, you know, paying money to get you into certain schools, like that reputation is going to follow you. So where you may not lose your degree, but you may lose some value of your reputation that you have because of this action. No, that's really good. That's really good. So, no, good point. I think we can wrap it up there. And uh, thank you guys for tuning in to this week's episode of Stuff Your Accountant Isn't Telling You. Until next time.